Uh, again, just a few words by mean of uh, preliminary remark. As you know, usually there is no preparation for this Sunday sharing of Dhamma. But once again, because uh, recently I have been giving a series of lectures at the Renmin University in Beijing. So uh, there are some notes that I prepared for the purpose of that, that series of lectures, not for this Dhamma uh, uh, sharing. So I'm making use of uh, one or two of the slides uh, to share some karma with you on the doctrine of karma that we have been discussing in the past few weeks. Uh, but you must understand, I believe you can understand that uh, uh, in the case of the actual lecture I gave in Chinese in uh, Renmi University, it's a three hour lecture, more than three hours actually, slightly, and uh, a lot of material which is not possible for me to reproduce now. So I'm going to just concentrate on one slide and uh, uh, that kind of forms uh, one major conclusion of that particular lecture. And then the, because I'm going to speak in Chinese English, so I'm going to give you the in corresponding English translation. But I must warn you that the English translation may not correspond exactly to the Chinese you are seeing. For those who can read the Chinese, I show the Chinese first. Uh, that's because uh, actually the translation was a literal translation from the Chinese text quoted. Uh, Description explanation by Sangapatra, but it's from a different text. Uh, Sangapatra has two texts. One is called the Nyana Nasara. The other one is called the um, Xian Zhong Lun. Uh, uh, normally restored as Samaya Pradipika. I'm not sure of the actual uh, original Sanskrit. Uh, generally, the second text I have just mentioned. Uh, summarizes or abbreviates what is said in the earlier text by the same author. Uh, I use that. I view this this shorter text because uh, in the in the in the class it's easier. And there's no time to quote the whole thing in Chinese. Uh, so I quoted the the shorter version that you can, you are seeing here. But the translation in my book uh, in English, I'm also providing you with that. However, it's a translation of the longer version. Hence, uh, I have not checked whether the two versions are identical wording as far as this part that you see in China concern. Now, um, it's uh, a continuation of the topic of what is called the Abhijapti Karma. It's a very important doctrine and uh, important contribution to, on the part of uh, the Sarvastivada. Uh, school of Buddhism, the Abhidhamma school called the Sarvastivada. I have said that, uh, that when it comes to the doctrine of karma uh, subsequent to the, the teaching of the Buddha himself in the suttas, uh, we find a lot more development in the case of Sarvastivada. And actually much of the development Parallels of development in the Theravada, in the Pali material, except that in the Sanskrit, in the Sarvastra tradition, uh, the doctrines are a lot more <coughs> uh, elaborate, articulated. Uh, they can serve as uh, explanations, further explanations uh, on the uh, Chinese uh, on the Pali commentary and Abhidhamma material actually. Uh, of course, in the Pali tradition, there is no corresponding uh, doctrine of the Abhijapti. This doctrine is uh, unique to the Swastivada, but um, you see similar concerns. Hmm? A lot of uh, uh, foundational uh, premises, foundational understandings are much the same. <coughs> but this doctrine, as it is developed in the form of the Abhijapti, it's called the Abhijapti yeah? doctrine in the Sarvastivada, is very interesting and it helps actually many things. 
so I want to share this with you also. Anyway, this, this is part of the course uh, that I'm giving uh, at the Renmin University. Now, uh, I think, I'm not sure whether I've given you the, the explanation of what I'm but I think I, but just very briefly, let's uh, repeat that. Abhichapti, the word means non-information, non-informing. Uh, the idea is that uh, when you come to the period of Abhidharma, everybody accepts that uh, all conditioned things, every dharma, lasts for only one moment, one shana, kana in Pali. And that is a very short period of time, the, the shortest actually unit of time, uh, the time required for a, a, a dharma, you will like a phenomena factor in our context, we can just confine ourselves to that. Uh, for that fundamental factor, a single factor of existence to arise only to cease, just that little bit of time, the smallest amount of time is called one shana. <coughs> So everybody accepts that view. And so for Buddhists, there's a, there's a problem about the question of continuity. On the one hand, the Buddha has taught that, uh, that, that there is preservation of karma. Karma is extremely important. In fact, one of the uh, fundamental teachings of, of, the, of the Buddha, of Buddhism, very, very much a major integral part of uh, the Buddha Dhamma, whether it is Theravada or other, any other school of Buddhism. So, uh, this doctrine is not to be denied by any Buddhist. There is karma, these are universal, if you like, moral laws of retribution. I think this, this sharing is should be useful for those who are taking the exam this year. <laughs> <laughs> taking the MA exam because there are questions on karma, uh, by the way. So, uh, that, is, that is an important doctrine that all Buddhists must accept. And uh, along with this is the whole uh, notion, the whole doctrine of samsara existence. Karma determines how we are, where we are going to be reborn, whether it's as human, whether it's as a, a heavenly being, or as a being in hell, as an animal, and also determines how we, uh, how our experiences are in, in a given mode of existence. Even as a human being, uh, we suffer, or we have a happy existence, uh, we become rich, we become poor, we are born in a particular community, we may like it, we may not like it. Many of you want to escape from the own communities, they want to go elsewhere, go to a different culture, like that, you see. Uh, but according to Buddhism, uh, we should first accept our karma, where we are. And uh, even in a, a given community, we are all different individuals. That again is, uh, to a large extent, not fully, not absolutely, uh, uh, not mechanically, but to a large extent determined by our karma. So we are all different. Uh, we have different temperaments, we have different feelings, we have different reactions, you know, we have different personalities. And we, we simply have to learn to accept ourselves and accept others. And it's very difficult to understand another person without understanding the karmic samsara background. So all these things are very, very important for the Buddhist. Eh? And that uh, all these understanding are to be found in the Buddha's teaching of karma, in the Buddhist teaching of karma. Of course, when you come to the Abhidhamma period, it's a period of uh, elaboration and uh, interpretations, of course. Uh, so not necessarily every word in, 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 the late, in this later period represents the actual intention of the Buddha's uh, teaching of karma, but certainly many, many things that are elaborated, they are commented, they are interpreted, are extremely helpful. Some are, uh, you know, uh, quite uh, correctly 
reflecting the original uh, intention of the Buddha, I believe. Hmm? At least a lot, a lot of it. Hmm? So the same applies to this doctrine called Amichapti. So I was saying that the, the, the problem for the Buddhists is on the one hand, that in this doctrine of karma and rebirth, sense of existence and so on, hmm? how uh, our existence determines how our experiences, our feelings, are, uh, characters are uh, largely determined. Uh, on the other hand, there's a teaching that everything is impermanent, and in this period, uh, the teaching that everything is uh, lasts only one moment. So, how do you account for continuity of karmic efficacy, given that the karma is chedana, uh, it lasts only one moment, the volition inside you? Uh, what happens after that? It doesn't mean that after that, one single moment, the efficacy of karma is lost, can't be like that. But there must be some kind of continuation until the time of retribution, until the time of vipaka. But the time of vipaka can be very long, sometimes many, many lives later. So what happened in between, you see? So the Buddhists uh, came up with various uh, models to try to explain this. Eh? And uh, so to make it story short, the Samastivada proposed this model called Amijapti. That is uh, invisible, a continual invisible karmic force, hmm? karmic energy. A serial continuation uh, projected by the momentary karma. Supposing uh, someone kills another human being, that killing, although it takes some time to complete the action, but when it's completed in the last moment, it lasts only that moment and then it lapses into the past. What happened after that, you see? So that this, this, this doctrine says that uh, at the time when the act of killing is committed, there comes into being a continuous, a projection of a continuous uh, series of current energy. Uh, so in Chinese, I think you are familiar with the term yip leg. Uh? Mm -hmm. So this force of karma continues, but invisibly. Yeah? Actually, they believe that uh, uh, the nature of this, this karmic force is actually material. It's a very interesting theory. But of course, uh, a very special type of material, not ordinary matter, mm -hmm. not ordinary rupa. Now, we're not going to go into that part of it. Uh, uh, although in my, my lecture series, I have spent a lot of time, even last week also, or, or rather last lecture. But now in this sharing, I'm not going to go into that very question. But uh, only into this uh, teaching that uh, there is uh, continuous invisible uh, karmic force that goes on until the time of ripening of the karmic cause, the so-called vipaka, right? Uh, uh, they need a model like this to explain that, first of all, it, there's a preservation eh, of the initial karmic cause, the efficacy of karmic force. Uh, so that helps explain continuity. Everybody is trying to provide an answer to continuity, you see. Actually, it's not just karma, but many, are in many other aspects. Huh? Uh, Buddhists had this kind of, if you like, philosophical difficulty. Not necessarily a, a problem that is not solvable, and Buddhists uh, solved it in many ways. And this is one example. Uh, so not only the question of continuity, but also the question of uh, continuous interaction. Because karma, the theory of karma teaches that, in the, the Buddha's own teaching also is clear, that it's not a mechanical, rigid, fixed principle. Uh, uh, rather, uh, the working itself, uh, uh, in a sense, a means of uh, flexibility, uh, the principle, of course, you can say, yes, it's the same, it remains the same. Uh, for instance, I've given examples in the past, in the last lecture, last week, 
that uh, according to one uh, sutta, very very important sutta in, in, in the Pali and also preserved in, in the Chinese, also in the Agama teachings, there's the a lump of salt. Huh? You remember that teaching? That is put in a cup, the same amount of salt also can be placed in a river. Now the same amount of salt, uh, even the nature of salt, will result in saltiness. Now if a person drinks a small cup of uh, salt water, that intensity of the salty taste is strongly felt, right? Uh, but if he puts the same amount of salt in a river and then scoop up some the water from the river and drink it and he doesn't even hardly feel it. Even though one cannot say that there's no effect of the salt. The effect is there but the effect is so diluted that, that it, it doesn't it doesn't uh, adversely affect. It doesn't give a unpleasant taste at all. Is it an unpleasant solid taste at all to the person who, who tastes it. So uh, the Buddha compared this to the case of two different persons, you see, uh, having committed the same act, same akusala act, unwholesome karma. Uh, one person, after committing that act, regrets and uh, cultivates his mind his behavior and that's a lot of good action yeah all these will contribute to uh, counteract the effect the efficacy of the original bad action or negative action right in such a way that uh, in fact uh, the effect of the karma uh, is going to be highly experienced by that person. Either it, is, it sometimes uh, it does not even it is not even experienced at all, and if it is experienced, then it doesn't harm the person in a negative way. That's because of his spiritual status, of his wisdom, of his samadhi, of his of his equipoise in his mind, and so on. You see. But the same act committed by the other person who doesn't regret and he goes on to practice evil, uh, that kind of person only strengthens the effect of the original action. And then he's going to uh, experience the ripening, the effect very, very widely, very, very strongly. And uh, the negative uh, effect can harm the person very much. So uh, you can see that in other words, uh, after doing that action, the point is that uh, there is possibility of interaction, there is possibility of counteraction, uh, 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 even to the extent of effectively Annihilating the the, the, the the efficacy of the original karma, you see. So uh, that gives hope to everybody. And uh, we mustn't think that the karma teaching is a teaching of fatalism, a teaching of absolute determinism. Yeah? Uh, we discuss much of those things in Pashmi. So in the case of this doctrine called Abhijapti, so if you want a translation, it is non-information, non-ancient karma. Yeah. Uh, the main idea is that at the time of committing a karma, there is perpetually this continuous series. That is called a non-information karma. That is called a Because it doesn't inform uh, the mental state of the person. Because it goes on invisibly. So uh, you can't see it, and you don't know the uh, mental state of the person, mm -hmm. uh, whether a person is having a negative thought or positive thought, whether a person is 
being kind mentally or being cruel mentally, it, it, that, that, that invisible flow doesn't express it, doesn't inform that way. Okay? Now, this doctrine states that because of this continuous uh, invisible force called Amijabdi, there is the possibility of continuous interaction every moment, because this series arises every moment. Even we, we are not aware of it after doing it. So when we are asleep, when we have fainted, when we are even meditation, there is no, in which there is no mental activity, still that series, that flow goes on. Yeah. Now, uh, again to cut the story short, in the course of the development of this doctrine in the Sarvasti Vada, uh, there is an interesting shift of uh, emphasis to uh, the connection with uh, to, 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 to this uh, connection of this doctrine with the notion of somber, of restraint. Uh, uh, restraint here refers to the commitment the moral commitment that one makes, the vow that one, the vows that one takes, let's say in an ordination ceremony. If you are uh, to be ordained as a, as, as, as a monk, as, as a bhikshu, then you have to make vows. You have to take a prati moksha vows. Mm? Like, I do not kill, I shall not kill for my whole life. Mm? And so on, we know that. Uh, now, the doctrine says that the doctrine says that uh, when the ordinary makes a vow very seriously, sincerely, there is perpetuated a force, a karmic force, a force of restraint. That is the abhijapti we are talking about. You don't see it, but it it it, it is perpetuated. And it goes on to affect that person in a positive way, spiritually positive way. And in fact, it helps to restrain the person. It helps to remind the person when negative thoughts, negative impulses arise. So that is very much emphasized as this doctrine develops. And also, now it the the the, the, the Sarvastivada, uh, Buddhist now they came to claim that uh, the status of being a, a, a monk or a nun, a, a bhikshu, bhikshuni, and upasaka, upasika, and so on. You know, in, for each category of ordinary, there are a certain definite sets of vows to take, certain set of commitment to make, right? Uh, each, in each case, when you make the commitment sincerely and properly, at that time it perpetuated this uh, invisible series of force. That force will go on. Even at other times, when the monk mind is not wholesome, nobody is fully wholesome for an ordinary person, you know. A monk can uh, have thought of hatred, huh? uh, have thought of harming others, and so on, you see. Uh, not that he wants, but everybody has defilements with him, you see. Uh, but at other times, he can be very kind. Yeah? So uh, that's a tragedy of hu human existence, huh? these, these contradictions uh, in every human being, including the monks and nuns, you know, everybody. Um, That force, however, continues even when the monk's mind has become negative, unwholesome, and it helps to restrain the mind, the, 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 person, the monk also, in fact, right? So now the Sarasimana come to claim that it is this Abhichapti that truly defines the monkhood, the status of monk, or, or nunhood, or the status of being a Buddhist, you know, being a upasaka or upasika. It's not the five precepts you have taken or the certificate you have got, but whether you have truly taken the commitment, the vows, when you are taking the precepts, you know, 
uh, as a result of which there is in you perpetrated a, for a series of force, a continuous series of force called Abhijapati. I think the idea is clear, right? So long as that force continues in you, whether you are aware of it or not, huh? but so long as it continues in you, then you are a true Buddhist, a true Pasaka, true Pasika, true monk, true nun. When that force is terminated, then you, even though you continue to wear the rope or you know you leave the temple, then you are not a monk. But there are various various conditions for 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 terminating that force. One is if you uh, if you volitionally make a vow and say, yeah, I, no, I don't want to be a monk, for example, or I don't want to be a Buddhist. I want to be a Christian now, mm-hmm. right? Then it is terminated. Or when you die, it's also terminated. Uh, again, we don't want to go into all these details. Hmm? It's a very fully, uh, articulately developed doctrine. Hmm? Okay, now, when that development uh, when it, when it was reached, uh, the emphasis seems to be somewhat shifted to uh, the question of samvara, question of uh, you know, uh, status of monkhood and so on, you see. Uh, so much so that uh, uh, later on, now modern scholars, uh, many of them argue that uh, the doctrine of Abhijapti was uh, was uh, uh, pro- uh, propounded, you know, in order to uh, account for the status of monkhood, of nunhood. So it has to do with the whole question of summer of, of ordination vows. And therefore, they claim, these scholars claim, that it is not a doctrine of karma. Tavi Chakti doesn't have a karmic role, right? So there is now, up to now, there is controversy. And um, mostly, can say that uh, discussed by Japanese scholars and also uh, shared by others, you know, Chinese scholars, Western scholars. And some see a karmic role, but most of them don't. And they say, no, no, the Abhijabi doctrine is not about karma, it's about samura. Yeah? The way they are described uh, for you. And even for those who agree that Abhijati is primarily a karma doctrine, right? They they are not sure of the the actual role, the karmic role of this invisible series of force called Abhijati. Why why do you need that? What ex- what kind of exact role does it play? Is it as an agent of karmic efficacy? So uh, there have been much controversies. Uh, we, again, we, we cannot go into all this now, uh, but it's very interesting to observe. Mm? Now even uh, many, many modern articles are written on this. I have myself contributed and uh, taken part in this kind of discussions. Uh, I have uh, published some articles the Japanese journals and also in my book you can see that uh, there's a long chapter on this. My understanding is that uh, actually from the beginning up to now the doctrine of Abhijapti is basically a doctrine of karma. Although it has been used right, to explain the standard of monk but the main the purpose of the doctrine is still a doctrine of karma. That is my argument. And also I try to show the exact karmic role. Yeah. Okay, now, uh, but when we search into the text, uh, most ancient texts do not explain clearly in what way this Amijapti work as an agent of preservation. Now you see the part of the reason why this uh, uh, 
modern controversies arose because um, in the Subhastivada there is a doctrine of tri-temporal existence of all dharma. So a karmic force, uh, a karma, okay, mainly is the chetana. So when the chetana arose just for one minute and it one one moment, one shana, uh, and after it has ceased and it has become past, it's still existent, it's still there. There's no problem about a past dharma existing in their system. So if a past karma exists, then you can see that uh, it is it's logical for them to say that later on, even many, many lives later, when the vipaka arises, that past karma is still there. It's not gone. It's, it, it, it's not vanished completely. And uh, it is still real, it's still existent, in as much as it still has efficacies. And one important efficacy is the so-called giving of fruit. Giving of fruit. In other words, at that very time, that karma that has been passed less than 10 lives ago, right, now is capable of actually making the corresponding effect, its effect, eh, come out into the present. So that, that efficacy is called giving of fruit. 10 lives ago, it has also important efficacy at when when the when I said the doer first did first commit that that act. Let's say take the example of killing. Uh, and uh, at that time it determines the causal relationship with the corresponding fruit. So if you kill someone, the fruit is that of let's say suffering in a certain form. Yeah? And uh, if you, for instance, uh, uh, kill a mother, father, or arahat is very serious, then you are, there's a determination for you to be born in hell. Of course, uh, there are different types of uh, karma. Uh, you take a more general one, the, a karma does not necessarily uh, lead to a retribution, we know that. But in the case of uh, that kind of examples of uh, uh, praticide, matricide and so on, of course, uh, it is said that uh, when it's committed, you def the person definitely will uh, go to hell huh? and so on. Anyway, uh, at, the, at the first moment of committing a particular karma, that karma is a cause that determines its corresponding effect. Each karma has current effect. Yeah, the nature, the time of its retribution. Yeah, that is called the projecting or grasping of the fruit. So it, it's a determination, specific determination of the, the cause effect relationship. Yeah, that is that 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 uh, takes place in the present moment of committing the karma. But as I said, uh, come, the, the effect comes out later, sometimes again, much later. In this example, say 10 lives later, right? Although the corresponding effect has been determined at the very first moment of committing, it has not uh, come out yet, right? has not been uh, ripened yet. So when the time it comes out, in the present, when the time is ripened, then that past karma perform another function that is called giving. So, the, so in this whole whole uh, process, first you have the projecting. That is the, the the moment of determination. That is in the very first present moment, the projecting of the of that corresponding fruit. But the fruit has not come out yet, right? Then subsequently, there is the giving of the fruit. There are these two steps. Hmm? In between, I'm trying to explain that the Abhishapti serves the function coming role of a force, a continuous force that interacts with a person's mind. 
and in fact it interacts with other uh, karmic contribution by the by the doer. You see, so as I said, you know, suppose you uh, suppose you you do a, a, a an evil action and later on you regret, and that is that that regret itself is a karma, yeah. Or if you rejoice, that is again the karma. All this will contribute a force. So the the series keeps on interacting with the mental state of uh, with the activities of the doer up to the time of the person's death or up to the time uh, before the termination of this series. There are other conditions that, as I said, that uh, lead to the termination, but up to the time of termination, I think it's easy to understand this way, there's continuous interaction. And this, this interaction is very, very important because it's, it's these interactions that helps to uh, uh, to determine whether uh, a karma is actually going to be even ripen or not. So we, we, we have spoken of karmas that are determinate in terms of ripening or that are non-determinate in terms of writing, ripening, right? So uh, I have explained to you that concept of having done a karma and having accumulated the karma. Can you remember? So if you have done a karma, it doesn't necessarily mean that the karma will definitely give an effect. So whether it can give an effect or not depends on the nature of karma for instance. Huh? And also depends on uh, what is called accumulation. A good karma after having done that, a person rejoices in it, right? And then the continuously doing good other good good acts, all this will contribute to strengthen yeah, the efficacy and make to ensure that, that good karma will produce an effect definitely. So that uh, the the ripening, the retribution will be become definite, right? And uh, however, a good karma, if it is followed by evil actions uh, uh, and so on, by the same doer, yeah, and also followed by other other factors, the effect, the effect may not ripen. If you've done something good, and you're supposed to really uh, experience or enjoy the positive effect, but you may not enjoy it or you may not enjoy it uh, in a way that you should you should have enjoyed uh, you are expected to be able to enjoy it. you know that so that is this notion of accumulation so karma is done but it has to be accumulated sufficiently accumulated uh, for it to become definite so now this process of uh, accumulation is contributed by this amijakti is how I see it. But uh, Sangapada, only when you come to later to about 5th century, the brilliant uh, Abhidhamma master of the Sarvastri school, he, only when you come to this period, uh, we can see in his work, he, he, he becomes very uh, articulate, uh, very intelligently explains. Uh, very articulately explains uh, about the coming role of the Abhijakti. Yeah. Uh, what this Abhijakti does, uh, how, how, how it contributes to this process of accumulation. Uh. Yeah, so now I'm going to uh, read this passage to you from his book, one of his books. Uh. Uh, this is the explanation in an interesting example. Supposing uh, a person A instructs a person B to kill C. Okay? So the person A doesn't directly kill C, but he asks somebody, 
you send the emissary to kill C, to murder C. Yeah? So how do you understand the effect of karma? You see now, for instance, uh, of course, in illegal karma, also you can see there's, there's a lot to be considered, right? Even if you go to the court, <laughs> has he himself committed the, 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 the act or not? So who is to be punished? Or if both are to be punished, the emissary and the instigator, uh, who is to be punished more and so on, you see? To have the, 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 the principal responsibility. A lot of interesting to, to, to examine even from the, the legal point of view. But I'm not talking about legality. I'm talking about the, the actual uh, spiritual uh, process or karma efficacies. Or to borrow the term, who, who is literally touched by the uh, by the evil act, you see, or by the effect of the evil act, hmm? who experiences it. So how, how come the person who himself has not killed C, A doesn't kill it directly, and how come he 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 is going to experience the effect of killing? It's a very serious one, right? Actually. Uh, all we can see in A is actually his verbal karma. He said, go and kill. He tells B to go and kill. That's verbal karma. Mm. Yeah? Of course, in his mind, the important don't forget, uh, he really wants to send B to kill C, then his chetana is definitely one of killing, one of murder. Yeah? It's, uh, it's uh, uh, definitely a kusar. But of course we can't see that, yeah? So what is only manifest is that vocal action. So you ask how come this has become so serious that when, the, when B actually kills C, when C is actually killed, then A is touched by the evil effect. Now, Sangapala explains that uh, the, 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 the doctor of Vijapti explains it. Right? It keeps a role, very clear role to it. Yeah? So first, uh, I invite those who can read Chinese to look at um, the projection there. And I hope you can, <laughs> you can understand enough Chinese. It's not easy to read this text. Huh? Even if you know each and every Chinese character, I have a phrase. Hmm? Have a go before I give it the answer.